Okay. Welcome back. Uh, OWASP is a community, and I see that it's a good platform for networking. So there was one guy coming up to me. I don't recall a name. As you know, I'm really bad with recalling names. So I think Kevin, is he here? And he asked me, is there other people who are working on uh, payment gateways? Where's Kevin? Yeah, stand up. So if you want to talk about uh, payment gateways and uh, about the security problems or solutions, I said just meet uh, at the end of the room so we can get together because always is about we work together as community. So Kevin, please, if you want to talk to him, just around there in the end of the keynote. Okay, so our lunch keynote speaker, the second of last uh, keynote speaker, but not the least, Steve Lord from the UK, London, uh, co-founder of 44.com and a breaker of things, as he said. But give him a warm applause. Okay. All right, well, well, thanks for having me here. Um, originally, he was supposed to get Chris John Riley, uh, and then it was passed around to a few people and a few other people a few other people. Eventually, it stopped with me. Enough people turn this lot down so that you've got to put up with me for the next 45 minutes. But that's not a bad thing, because to give you an overview of who I am, because you're probably wondering who the hell I am to talk about IoT when you've got people like Josh Corman here and you've got all these famous people, I've been working with embedded Linux platforms since the 90s. Uh, sometimes to do with security, sometimes just building stuff, and sometimes just working with people in fields like point of sale and all kinds of other stuff like that. Um, in my day job, I'm a pen tester at Mandalorian these days, uh, which is a small UK consultancy. And I also co-organize an event called 44 Con London. Our CFP is currently open, so if you're interested in talking at it, you can always go to 44con.com and have a look. I also foolishly decided that I'd try writing a book, um, which is getting there. Uh, it's a book on pen testing, and uh, that's not really what I'm here about today. I'm here to talk about the internet things. So I've also been to AppSec before. I spoke in 2009 about WordPress vulnerabilities, um, which is a bit like shooting fish in a barrel, really, when you think about the themes and plugin architecture. But I wanted to open with asking everybody, do you remember that time that we solved all the web bugs? Do you remember that day? That day the last XSS bug was finally put to rest? See, because in the beginning there were web apps, and the web apps had bugs, and people got together and posted guidance on how to fix the bugs. And then everybody went and fixed the bugs, and the bugs were all put to rest. But then somebody came up with more technology. We had virtualization. We had the cloud. We had a whole set of services that we have to approach in a completely different way to provide assurance to end users and customers. And then we found out that our governments were spying on each other as well as us. So then we found out that we had to encrypt. And encryption is a hard problem to solve. And doing it correctly is an even harder problem to solve. And we updated the guidance, and more things were produced. But the world didn't become a safer place. If anything, it became a less safe place. We now live in a world where we have ubiquitous, pervasive, uh, always connected devices. And these devices are developed with a set of perverse incentives in mind that don't necessarily align with our own. And the thing I want to talk about today are, are those things Smart things. Smarter, better, faster, stronger. This talk is about those things. And I want to start with one of the most important things of all, a device that allows you to measure your farts. In case you weren't aware of this, you know you're in an investment bubble When there's a Kickstarter that 73 people think is a good idea to have something that presumably you put near your bum, <laughs> you push a button, you let it rip, and it goes, eh, eh, you had too strong a curry last night. <laughs> I'd buy it. <laughs> but then again, I'm not the kind of person who needs to track my own gases. I'd track other people's gases. I'd find ways to monetize gas data. And then we have Vessel over on the top right, 
which has possibly the creepiest tagline I've ever seen. Vessel automatically knows everything you drink. I mean, it sounds like it was developed by the NSA. <laughs> smart plate is um, backed by science. Science backs it. What does smart plate do? We don't know. It's backed by science. <laughs> science agrees. Science backs smart plate. Smart plate will apparently tell you what you ate. Personally, I like the old fashioned way of not eating with the blindfold on. <laughs> and then there's Dharma, the world's first smart cushion, which is a device that actually measures your butt. And these are the things that are getting funded. And then when we think about what's on the market, at five to ten times the price of a, of a dumb kettle, some might say a smarter customer, you know. I would expect a kettle to be so smart that it has a PhD and can debate fine art with me for that price. <laughs> it's a device for people that can fill a kettle with water but cannot push a button to turn it on. <laughs> it's a device for people who can't push a button to turn it on but can use a smartphone. And it's a device for people who want stats on how often they don't push the button. But I want to talk about Vessel. Vessel's interesting because it's $200 for effectively a cup. So it's a $200 cup that measures what you drink. Again, assuming that you are the one who poured the drink in, you would have a handle on this. But it measures and tracks all that. Now, some of these reviews of Vessel have said it's revolutionary. It's going to change everything about what you drink. And in a way, keeping track of that nutrition stuff is pretty cool. But what happens when you go to a pub and drink out of something that isn't vessel? Of course, the answer is to buy more vessels. But I have to ask, $199 for a cup, who's the mug? <laughs> this is not the dumbest smart thing. This is the dumbest smart thing. <laughs> smart socks. This is not a problem in search of a solution, no. Who here has an odd number of socks in their sock drawer? Yeah, show of hands. This is, this is a problem that affects nations, my friends. <laughs> and now, with unique sock pairing technology, <laughs> you'll never lose your socks again. Not only that, these socks will tell you when they need to be washed. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a pretty radical thing. You're probably like me. You just throw the socks against the wall, and if they stick, they're good for another week. <laughs> but these socks, oh, no, no, these tell you. And they also tell you when you need to buy more socks, which I'm presuming will be often. <laughs> but as great as it is to look at IoT and define it as the intersection of money and stupidity, there is a serious point to be made. We need to define what IoT is in order to truly understand the security implications. So if we look at this in terms of common vertical markets that use IoT, you can see here that we have several examples. We have the energy sector, so smart metering, which in many impl implementations usually turns out to be incorrect metering. There's home automation. Because when corporations spy on you, it's OK, because they're not nation states. But when you look at things like even simple stuff, like using TVs as a hub, and you find that your Samsung TV is sending everything you say to a third party, or you've got devices like Amazon Alexa, which, you know, I can understand Amazon's mission, stick a device in the home, make it listen to everything that they say, pick up on the words, so that you can try and get dad to buy more shit that he doesn't need at prices that he can't afford. Yeah. But also, you've got things like we, uh, uh, Wemo and Philips Hue and various other products that you know, historically might not have existed. And they're gathering rather strange types of data. And what we'll probably see in the next sort of few years is you'll start to see more general purpose hubs that bring things together. And then we have personal smart things. So I'm wearing a personal smart thing, which is a little pebble watch. And um, I would classify a personal smart thing as any device that is deemed smart that can be consumed by dumb people. 
like myself. Normally, these link to either home networks or personal devices. And the distinction between home automation, or rather home things, and personal things is something that I'll touch on in a bit. Then we have medical devices, which frankly scare the crap out of me, um, to the point where I, I'm not even going to cover this in this talk, because that would be a whole talk in itself. Um, and finally, transport, which you might think is just self-driving cars, or in-car in entertainment systems, or the merging of in-flight entertainment systems and avionics critical mission systems, depending on what you're doing this week. Um, but it also covers things like fleet management, logistics, solving the traveling salesman problem in some cases, literally, um, and real-time management of fleets. And if we define the technologies that are involved in IoT, we start to understand what IoT potentially really means, which is that it's not really a thing in itself. Although it's called Internet of Things, IoT isn't a thing. It's a collection of technologies presented and integrated to provide specific applications. And if we break those down into the components, we'll see that most things generally have some of these components. So there's a sensor. Now, I've said that that's a thing that reacts to external stimuli. stimuli. The sensor itself doesn't really react. The sensor senses. But that will connect to a widget, which is the thing part of the Internet of Things. Normally, this will be something like an AVR a microcontroller, or it might be something like a, an Arduino-type device, or it could be something a bit bigger like a Raspberry Pi or a Linux system. And a lot of what goes into the widget depends on whether that needs to have real-time functions, where it just does one task again and again continuously, or whether it can have schedule-based stuff and something a bit more complex and maybe do some processing on there. The widget then normally will connect to either a mobile app or a front-end web app, sometimes a bit of both. So if, if we look at the distinction between fixed widgets, which are widgets that sit in your house or sit in your business, they will connect to your network. And your network will be the bearer of security, transport security, within your local physical environment. And when you look at mobile widgets, like this, this will connect to your phone. And your phone becomes the widget, in effect, that communicates with the, with the internet. So sometimes you'll get a mobile app, and sometimes that will just be simply uh, a web view uh, put onto a front-end web app. And sometimes you'll have a front-end web app so you can internet your thing when you don't have a Fondle slab with you. That will usually communicate to something stored in the cloud. So the data usually gets shoveled into the cloud because it's cheap. And a lot of these things have been brought into existence without a regulatory framework for the information that they, they actually hold. And then you've got a back-end web app, which is the bit where the people who produce the thing mine the data and administrate the data. And in my experience, that back-end web app usually tends not to be worth the ones and zeros it was written. And then, finally, there's your data, which is usually sold to the highest bidder. But let's not also think about the lowest bidder as well, because they get your data in different ways for your things. So to look at what's involved in these things, if we look at the sensors, Realistically, when it comes to a security standpoint, what we need to think of sensors are as input fields. So if, for example, your widget that connects to your sensor expects a temperature value, it may store that value as a fixed point integer. Um, however, for your sensor itself, that's going to have some leads going off to a microcontroller that will interpret the signals that are sent. You cannot assume that just because the sensor has an operating temperature between, say, 50 degrees Celsius and minus 50, that the only figures that will come back will be 50 to minus 50. So we treat it as a form of user input, for want of a better term, and validate it. When it comes to the widget, oh, sorry, hang on. Let me go back one there. There we go. When it comes to the widget, Again, that widget connects to the internet. Now, that's either going to connect to the internet in the case of a mobile phone over a 4G network or a GSM network, or in the case of fixed infrastructure, it will use whatever the bearer network is. So for developers of the Internet of Things type devices, they cannot make the assumption that um, the bearer network is all secure, and thus they can't provide security configurability in that space really to any great extent. OK. 
Go on. You can do it. That's not good. The value quote, space quote, is invalid. Please, please provide a valid value. I think I just failed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the mobile application, I think OWASP has a pretty good handle on that. And I think fundamentally that if we were to look at the Internet of Things, perhaps one of the ways that OWASP could actually work the best would be to act as a clearinghouse for current documentation and other projects in the specific technology spaces. So providing links to things like, you know, uh, build it securely, I am the cavalry, that sort of stuff where there's other stuff going in. And then we have the cloud. And this is, from an IoT perspective, something a little different. So let's say, for example, you know, I've got this Pebble watch here. Let's have a, let's have a look. Has anybody got a smartwatch of any kind? Can you put your hands up? Including people who have them in the drawers at home? <laughs> okay. All right, okay, who's got a Pebble? Okay, and who's got an iWatch? Not many people went and paid five times the cost of a Pebble. Oh, sorry, okay, my bad. All right. So, actually, this is an this is an Apple Watch as well. It's I've got the watch face set to OS X. Your move, fanboy. <laughs> so, so um, yeah. But the data that comes out of this watch goes off to various servers based on the apps you install, and they all use JavaScript. Now, amongst the information that this can detect and provide is pulse information and movement information. So if we were developing something like a Fitbit type tracker that we install on the watch, then actually we might think, oh, we'll carry that data out. But when we carry that data out and we store it in the cloud, we're actually storing potential health data. And if one day the US government decides to regulate this, it's possibly going to turn around and say, health data, HIPAA. Treat it as HIPAA. Treat it as something else. The EU will look at the health data and will say, Maybe we should treat this the same way that individual states treat health data, which, if you're in the UK, is a freaking nightmare because NHS data is, is ridiculously managed. But you'll have to take all of this stuff into account. You'll wake up one day and you'll find that for some countries you just can't put this stuff in the cloud anymore because even though it's just pulse rate and steps, it's actually data that's deemed quite sensitive in some circumstances. And also the obligatory encrypt Authenticate, authorize all access to the cloud stuff is fairly standard. Okay. Oh, I'm not doing well here. Come on. Are we going to do that? There we go. Front end web app is something that we should all know about. I don't think anyone in this room doesn't know how to handle a web app. Um, one of the things that I've, I've noticed is does anybody here go out and talk to external customers? Uh, maybe selling scanning services or pen testing services. How many of the people that go out here get asked, do you check for the top 10? Yeah. The top 10, the OWASP top 10, is probably OWASP's biggest success. But it's also a double-edged sword in that, in many respects, it's turned into a compliance target in the eyes of consumers. So I would suggest that we forget the top 10 and that we focus on the common weaknesses enumeration from Meta, which maps across to the top 10 quite cleanly. And the reason I would suggest using CWE is that if you're implementing a thing, using CWE across the spectrum lets you track all of the vulnerabilities using common classifiers. So you can see vulnerabilities that go end to end from start to finish through every aspect of the technology that you use. Of all the OWASP projects that are well suited to a complex solution like an IoT um, solution, I would say ASVS is perhaps the most um, well mapped to go across. Using something like an ASVS level two or even a level three for say medical systems would actually be a really good way of being able to provide some form of assurance to end users of these systems that you're doing the right thing. I don't expect somebody to do ASVS three for a device meant to measure your farts but I would expect it to do it for something like an insulin regulator. And it's a good standard to look at. And finally, at the other end of the spectrum, at the not so, uh, somewhere between not so sensitive and medium sensitive, rather than going and getting this stuff tested, a lot of these devices are built on shoestrings. So save money and go and look at a bug bounty, 
which won't find everything that could possibly affect your solution. But that's why you have an internal program. Having a bug bounty will at least find some of the most serious things. And the people who are most likely to look into this are actually going to be your customers. When it comes to the back-end web app, just don't assume that it won't be accessible. There's an awful lot of IoT products that are out there where the back-end web app is actually also stored and served from the cloud. And it's spun up so that they can access it when they need to, and then with the idea of expanding it, because it'll be built on the same stack as the front end. But if it can be found, then that information can be taken. And as with the front end app, I would say, use the usual integrate testing at the release cycle stuff, and look at putting in some sort of monitoring to make sure that you're tracking where people are coming in from. Now, when it comes to IoT, the people that pitch devices to VCs and get funding are often tasked with monetizing the output of that. So if you develop an IoT device, you have your widget and you have a service. The customer is only going to pay for the widget. So you need to fund that service somehow. And the way that you sustain that funding is by monetizing the data. So if you don't have it, you can't lose it. There's an element of being a good internet citizen to be had. And the fact of life is that if you're taking data that seems innocuous now, it might not be innocuous in certain ways if it's processed in certain ways. And don't assume that those requirements are not going to change. Because at the moment, there's so many things coming out, legislation and regulation can't catch up, will keep up, but it will catch up eventually. Now, I think that we've got a way to secure this. And this is Malachite. And this is taken from a book on, uh, what is it? Crystals and business success. This is better than, um, so at 44Com we give away books each year and we give away lots of prizes. And for the past five years I've been trying to get my partner on a watch list by ordering weird stuff off Amazon and getting them sent to him so that it can be given out. My favorite book that I ever gave away was Beat Your Way to the Top, Masturbation as a Tool for Success. <laughs> but malachite, malachite is a copper-based mineral. Placed on your desk, malachite will soak up your electromagnetic pollution emitted by your computer and other appliances. You can make it your own personal guardian against viruses that can attack your computer and email. <laughs> Pick up your stone and hold it firmly in your hand to feel its power and purifying abilities. <laughs> Ask it to soak up any negativity from your office space. Stone, I don't think people believe you. <laughs> and send out strong, positive, energetic rays around your computer to keep it virus-free. Circle the stone around the computer twice daily. <laughs> Morning and late afternoon. Cleanse the stone after each use under running water. So, probably not near the computer. <laughs> but seriously, OWASP actually have an IoT top 10 project, and I'm going to apologize up front. I've, I, when, I start, when I was asked to do this originally, I've already been doing quite a bit of I, stuff that would be considered IoT, but was also not necessarily IoT, it's just embedded stuff. Um, and I'll apologize because I've made these observations without being able to talk directly to the project. The OWASP IoT project doesn't get a lot of love, and it appears to be mostly driven by one guy who's doing the best he can. Um, and he's not getting a huge amount of feedback. Now, I only managed to subscribe to the mailing list today because I didn't know there was a mailing list because it was put into a different tab and somewhere on the web page that I couldn't see. Um, but I will raise all the points that I'm going to make with, with that person and with that project. Um, because I do feel that it's easy for someone to go up on stage and say, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. 
it's harder to go on stage and actually say, these things need addressing, and I am prepared to go and help address them. The question is, are you? Um, so these are the first five of the top 10. You've got I1, which is insecure web interfaces. Fair enough. I2, insufficient authentication authorization. Yep. We've got insecure network services. Certainly, that's a really common thing. Uh, we've got some bugs with a drone manufacturer that are basically similarly along those lines. All of those things so far apply. Uh, lack of transport encryption would potentially be better as weak or insufficient transport encryption, but I think that's splitting hairs. Likewise, the privacy concerns is something I think would be maybe I1, but again, splitting hairs. And with this top 10, IA is where it starts to go wrong. You've got an insecure cloud interface, which is something that I've certainly seen in a heck of a lot of, of um, IoT devices that use things like IFTTT, if this, then that. Is it IFTTT or is it IFTT? Yeah. Anyway, and uh, insecure mobile interfaces, not so common, although um, there are, for example, situations like the Pebble, for example, where you run apps and there's a helper app on, an, on a mobile device where there's certainly issues that come up. Um, and then I8 is where it starts to go a little bit, not sideways, but things look like they could do with some help. So security configurability is something that's very, very difficult to do in the IoT space because of their limitations. I9 starts to talk about the security of the firmware update process and about using encryption. And I've got some issues with that, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I-10, poor physical security, I have some issues with that as well, which I'll raise here. And obviously, I'll raise offline with the, with the guys in question as well. And what it really boils down to is that I-9 and I-10 in particular make recommendations that work against the user. And um, they work against the user by removing that freedom to tinker and removing certain things you would expect with ownership of a general purpose computing platform. And the question is, should OWASP promote ideas in the name of perceived security that work against the user's own interest? Or should we try and work around that and try and keep things open? So what are the problems with 8, 9, and 10? Well, let's bring them up. So we've got here an example here, no ability to enforce strong password policies, no ability to enable data encryption at rest, um, you know, no, lack of password security options, security monitoring, security logging, all of these things sound inherently practical for a web-based application, but are not necessarily practicable for um, an IoT solution. The ability to separate normal users, uh, if, we, if we were to look at the writing, it says sufficient security configurability requires these things. So separate normal users, encrypt data at rest or in transit, four strong password policies, enable logging of security events, and notify end users of security events. The issues that I have with this are fairly straightforward. So many IoT devices don't have options for security configurability because they don't have interfaces that you use. Your interface is often a mobile application that's separate to the device. Now, you can argue that you can put security configurability options in on the, on the application, but then you've got the issue of, is the user going to make the right choices? And are you providing sane options, or is it better to provide sane defaults? They're normally built for a single purpose, the user password paradigm really sucks for IoT. So um, let's take, for example, a washing machine. LG do a smart washing machine that allows you to define multiple users. They're members of the family. Now, there is no situation in which you want to have a password on a washing machine user account. <laughs> I can't get in and do my washing. I can't peel the socks off the wall. <laughs> um, configurable crypto is an issue. When we, we're all aware of the issues surrounding cryptography, and we're all aware of the issues surrounding nation state activity. And if you're de developing something that would be useful to a nation state adversary, then they're going to exploit that. 
even if you're not, then there's going to be some data that's going to be sensitive enough to warrant encryption. But by putting the choices for encryption in the user's hands, you're risking them making poor choices. And to give you an example, um, how many people here are familiar with wired equivalent privacy? Yeah? So WEP, WEP Wi-Fi, which is totally broken. So one of my friends has, um, one of my less technical friends got a broadband router, and on their broadband router, it had on the Wi-Fi options, it had wired equivalent privacy, WPA, WPA2. They picked wired equivalent privacy because it had the words wired equivalent, so it's, a, it's like a cable, right? And it had privacy in it. And that was just from you know, misreading the choices that were available and them not understanding what the options meant. And if we ask people to choose between Diffie-Hellman and ECDH and TLSV 1.1 and 1.2 and SSL 3.0, they're going to make the wrong choices. So those, because of the nature of these devices and because of the nature of the data, the people who understand the threat landscape are the people managing the service. It makes more sense for them to set sane options and manage that as part of the service. Configurable logging. If you've got a Nike fuel band, what security events do you want to have logged? If you've got a Wemo switch, what security events do you want to have logged? The people have hacked Wemo switches so that they can continuously go on and off and you can set a lamp on fire or, or destroy a kettle or something like that. But in the grand scheme of things, how is that compared to dropping a plane out of the air? Um, again, things are going to be different depending on the activities. How feasible are granular permissions on a single purpose platform. You know, um, if we take, for example, a toaster, a smart toaster, smartest toaster ever. Anybody ever see the talky toaster on Red Dwarf? Yeah? Would, you, would you like a, a, a piece of toast? Anyone for toast? Anybody? Anybody want toast? That level of smartness. The talky toaster didn't care who he was making toast for. All he cared about was toasted bread products. And likewise, our users are going to be the same. If we look at the insecure firmware, we've got encryption not being used to fetch updates, update file not being encrypted, update file not being verified before upload, uh, sensitive information in the firmware, and of course, no obvious update facility. Now, that's, some of that is fairly normal, but some of that really goes against the user experience in terms of the right of ownership. So, the, the things that need to be done in order to secure it say, encrypt the firmware, use a crypto key, go and encrypt the firmware, download it over an encrypted link, encrypt it as it goes in, decrypt it, put the firmware update on. Um, that's not really feasible for most of these devices. I think it was, um, I forgot the name of the guy, I think it's Paul Metcalf, did some stuff about RSA encryption on an AVR, and basically, this is when he was doing some stuff about integrating OAuth into a thing called Mosquito for uh, token-based authentication of things. And he found that RSA crypto above 512 bits just doesn't work. It's just not feasible. So a lot of these devices don't have TPMs. So how are they going to manage the keys? There's the issue of having multiple types of firmware, some of which are binary blobs. If we take the Pebble watch, for example, this watch is mostly open source. It runs an operating system called FreeRTOS. However, there are binary blobs for the Bluetooth driver. The option to have the source for that isn't there. But there's more than one piece of firmware to apply. There's more than one way of upgrading it. Are we saying we use the same keys for this or different ones? And there's an important part, well, two important parts, I feel. One is keeping IoT honest, because a lot of IoT is built on open source platforms. And a lot of IoT vendors don't want to release the source because they're worried that they'll get impersonated and there'll be clones that'll pop up. So encrypting the firmware doesn't make it impossible to find GPL violations, but it makes it harder than just looking for things like BusyBox inside the firmware. And then there's the question of who owns the device, because the only person that you're protecting for when you encrypt firmware, the only person you're protecting in that case, is the vendor. You are not protecting the user in any way, shape, or form by encrypting the firmware. Final part here, poor physical security, which is basically saying remove a load of stuff that you don't need, remove debug ports and things like that. Um, yeah. 
A lot of these devices are built on system on chip systems. Um, so even things like we've worked on, in my day job, we've worked on defense systems for, 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 with military applications. And even they have you know, a TTL or a JTAG or something on them. Um, a lot of the time for things like uh, stuff that will be built on smaller chipsets, you'll have that TTL embedded inside the actual chip pins. You can get AVRs that have got certain things like um, electronic fuses to stop you from reading the chip and all that, but that falls back to who are we really protecting here by doing this. There's also an element of cost, because the cost of getting this stuff hardened is significant, and unless you're talking about a device in which tinkering will ruin somebody's life or end somebody's life, there's the question of whether or not that's actually worth it. And that freedom to tinker element is actually important, at least I believe so, because I believe that someone like OWASP should fight for the user. But then again, who am I to say what OWASP should and shouldn't fight for? I'm just a guy who shouts from the sidelines. It's, and and I, I do want to apologize, because it's, it's easy to, to pick flaws in stuff. I get paid to do it all the time. Um, and to be fair, you know, some of these recommendations that we're seeing also exist elsewhere. But this presents us with quite a dilemma, which is should an open project promote um, ideas and patterns that work against the end user? And I'd like to put forward a truism, which is that the OWASP top 10 is often seen as a compliance target rather than a starting point. It's the panacea, not the, uh, the bit from the get-go. And if it's to be successful, the IoT top 10 will occupy the same space in the IoT realm. Another observation would be that having items in a list to make you know, them up to 10 is not necessarily the smartest move for smart things, if you'll pardon the pun. But I think there's a call to action to be made. I've read about keynotes. They often have calls to action. And I'd like to make a call to action, which is to say, let's make sure that OWASP fights for the user. Let's make sure that OWASP keeps IoT vendors honest when it comes to license violations with open source projects. OWASP needs to support open hardware, open software, and the freedom for tin to tinker. And the reason for that is, put simply, that it's an open project. It's the only thing that could do that of, it, of its sort. So I put forward this idea, and I will present it. I'm not suggesting that it really should be considered I-11. I will talk with the project, and I will sit down with them, and I would encourage you to take part in that discussion uh, with me. But I'd like to present the idea of insufficiently open platforms as a security risk, because those things that close those bits down, they're not really providing security. They're providing obscurity. And that when you have an IoT device, service, or platform that acts against the user's interests, against the openness that provided the very platform on which it was built, then we must regard this as a failure to provide genuine user security. And we should have a think about who these devices serve. And the reason for that is, if OWASP won't support open security, then who will? And I think that's a question that everybody needs to consider, not just within the scope of IoT. And that's what I'll leave you with, that and the, the fart calculator. <laughs> so I'd just like to thank, before I leave you, I'd like to thank Chris John Riley, who, who is ultimately the man responsible for me being here, for good or bad. I'd like to thank Caroline Rogel, who um, was really awesome in helping me get here, and also Martin for putting on such a superb event. Um, and I'd like to thank my old friend Dennis, who I had a chat with about various bits and pieces on this, and whether or not I should be questioning this stuff, and he encouraged me to do so, rather than just turning up, telling a few jokes, and going home. Um, so at this point, I'd just like to throw it out to everybody and ask, has anybody got any questions or thoughts about IoT security or on, on openness? I mean, is this the right thing to do, to push for an open security platform? Yep. Has anybody got any thoughts on, on um, how that conflict between what a vendor may need in terms of protecting themselves and, and what OWASP as an organization should recommend should be handled? 
I mean, if we have, for example, a device that uses DRM because it needs to play codecs that are protected, how should we handle that? Gentleman in the back. Uh, earlier, you excluded medical devices and you talked about airplanes. So <laughs> it's thought provoking. You're challenging some of our philosophy about open projects and the ability to tinker. Do you think the airplane flight system entertainment should be open to tinker? Where are the boundaries to this proposal, I guess? I think that we can balance it. I mean, certainly where you've got a point of, um, of people's lives being at risk, there is a need to provide some level of enforcement. And I think the avionics example you provided is both incredibly timely relevant and a, a very good point. But we can provide systems. I mean, those avionics packages, for example, have service ports. They're designed to be serviceable by the vendor. And that, in effect, is your freedom to tinker there, for want of a better term. Um, an avionics platform belongs in a locked environment put into a plane where you can't just go in and access it. So I think that would be that specific example, but I think it's very right to ask where the boundaries of that freedom to think lie. Um, certainly, if I had a device that could measure my methane output, I'd like it to be able to measure other things as well. But my car, for example, if I have a self-driving car, running code that you've got from the internet and installing it on your self-driving car is probably not the smartest idea. But then again, there's an element of Darwinism that may correct that. Hey, very nice talk. Um, have you had thoughts about the emerging networks that want to replace the, the traditional transport layer and mm -hmm. go through, like, I think, like, LoRa? There's a LoRa Mac, and there, be, there have been some, some open source implementation by IBM. And basically, they, they want to, to move the IoT through another channel. It's a mix of radio and something at the telcos. And, and you, you'd, you'd, had, you'd, have, you'd have crypto um, uh, over, but, but through, the, through the hardware. No, a bit like a um, SIM card or else. So, um, so, for example, chips that have built in crypto for RF links, that sort of thing? Yeah, and basically, I think from what I, I know, there's Sigfox, um, mm -hmm. uh, which, which has some limitation, and, and you have the LoRaMac, which has been develop, um, even deployed over Europe. And they want to give this um, this new network. You know, it's like for it's kind of 4G. I know it's it's busy to say that, but it's kind of special network, special radio network where all IoT data will go. So, has anybody ever heard of a network called Tetra? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Tetra is kind of a bit like GSM, but not, and has yeah. its own little bits on it. It's a little bit different. A large part of the security for the rollout of Tetra in the UK was rested on the idea that people won't be able to buy their own Tetra handsets. And as long as we're not going down that road of saying that we shift this out of the conventional accepted bearer networks, you know, it's like saying if we, if we roll our own crypto, people won't be able to break it. I mean, to give you an example, I have a bunch of RM, RF um, RFM69 modules, which are these little, about yay big, chips um, and boards that I use on home automation sensors, and they use AES128. Good. However, totally vulnerable to replay attacks because of the way they implemented it. Not so good. I think that in terms of the transport network, the, the, the realistic thing has got to be we've got to provide secure transport options. Um, but I'm not sure that just moving stuff for the sake of it would be a good, good idea. We, we'll see, because actually it's, there's just the marketing fuzz mm -hmm. over it. You have LoRa, which is in front of everyone, and you have LTE, LTE-M that, that's coming, so 3GPP is fuzzing, mm -hmm. so we'll see with RFC. Thank you. Two more questions. Um, yeah, uh, I've been wondering, this is Anne Rikuya Robbins, I've been wondering uh, what the, um, what the attraction of uh, the Internet of Things was for so many uh, parts of uh, the economy. And I see that in large part it's because it's unregulated. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a way to get personal data 
uh, and to claim it, own it, uh, monetize it, resell it. Uh, so to answer your question, I think absolutely that uh, there should be work begun now because if not, then uh, when, by the time regulation gets around, there will be another 20 years of, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the user getting the short end of it, actually. And so uh, I would love to volunteer to be one of your first uh, advocates and to work eagerly on this. I think the time is now. I think we need to get underway with it. So the OWASP Top 10 project for IoT, there's a page on the wiki, and if you go to the community part, onto the mailing list archives, um, there's a link to the subscription page. So I would probably say that the first thing to do in terms of providing support to that project would be to sign up, as I did, and just start the conversation. Because ultimately, if IoT Top 10 is successful, it will be accepted as a standard rather than as a starting point. And we need to make sure that what we have here is an opportunity to create something that may be considered a standard, but that we're pointing people to the right information. So things like the points about insecure web controls in you know, I1 on there is a really, really good point to have because we can go, insecure web controls, by the way, here's everything you ever wanted to know about how to implement a web app properly. You know? When it comes to things like the cloud, an insecure cloud interface, actually OWASP doesn't have an awful lot of information about it. There's a, an OWASP cloud project that's kind of gone stale. And that, but I think that acting as a clearinghouse, and this is just, these are just my thoughts, and like I say, I'm not part of that project. These are just my thoughts. I think that acting as a clearinghouse, OWASP has the potential to really shape the nature of the discussion about IoT. Um, and to act, act as a, a point of, of information, for want of a better term, to point at things like build it securely, I am the cavalry, and to support those other projects is something that I think is the greatest thing that OWASP could probably do in this space. It's time. It's time? All right. Thanks a lot. Steve Lord. Those who have done not